Welcome to Helpings Connect, where we share insight and wisdom on healing, empowerment, and regeneration. I'm your host, Stephanie Wang, and today I'm so excited to have as my guest, my friend, Maxie Cohen. Maxie Cohen is an award-winning film and video maker and multimedia artist. Her films have played in movie theaters, film festivals, and television around the world, and have influenced two generations of filmmakers. As a media activist, her film and television work has had significant influence in creating visible social change. Her works have been exhibited internationally and are in the permanent collections of numerous museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Israel Museum Jerusalem, and National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. Welcome, Axie. Hi there. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. So, you know, I, I would love to start with an, a little bit of an origin story. Um, as a young child, did you always know that you wanted to be an artist? And what does being an artist mean to you? I did always want to be an artist. I, I used to hide in my room and paint and and I remember when I was about, I don't know, 13 or 14, um, having these arguments with my mother because I wanted to go, I guess it was a little later when you apply for college. I don't know, I was in high school maybe. And um, I said, I wanted to go to art school. And my mother said, oh, you have to make a living. And I would, I would say, how do you know I can't make a living? You know. <laughs> Picasso didn't come out of the womb with a paintbrush in his hand. How do you know? And we would have these kind of um, arguments because she, you know, she herself was a survivor of the Holocaust. So safety, mm -hmm. security and uh, was very important. She grew up in Germany, very wealthy and um, very well educated. She came here when she was 12 graduated as valedictorian so she had this fear you know and it's interesting because I came out of somebody who it's it's really interesting who believed that everything the police the newspaper and doctors tell you are 100% true and that if you can't touch it it doesn't exist so I think in a way <laughs> that my whole life <laughs> um trying to understand that which we do not see uh, with our with our, with our own eyes question right. um, the medical profession uh, authority and the media so um, but I did go to film school because I saw a um, a film on television and I believe that the filmmaker had gone to NYU it was an animated film so I figured, well, I'll just paint and animate and that'll be a profession. But I got to NYU and there was no animation. And, uh, uh, and from the beginning, I just, you know, it, you, in film school, many people want to be a director or a producer or, a, and I, it wasn't like that for me. I just thought, well, some ideas are worth a feature film and some ideas are worth a postcard. And I was much more interested in concepts in, in what it was to be made, not what role I would play. And, um, and I think from the very beginning, I was rebellious. I remember we had to make a three minute film, how to get through a doorway. And I took the equipment instead and raised some money. And the very first film I made I found a community of black Jews that were hiding in the Pine Barrens of South Jersey that had escaped the anti-Semitism uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, in the in the you know the ghetto of Philadelphia. Uh -huh. so they, uh, and and uh, they were very interesting because they were culturally black, but Orthodox Jews. So, were they falashas? By any chance? Well, most of them were really con um, converted Baptist choir singers. So the music is amazing. I'm actually, I'm just trying now to find a way 
to finally make an album from that music that I took then because it was all wow. traditional music, but sung like gospel. I'd never heard any, nobody's ever heard anything like this. Uh, but they followed the Torah to the, to the letters. So for Passover, they actually slaughtered a lamb and put blood on their door posts, which I don't think anybody has done in thousands of years. I don't know whether I'm- Wow. Mean, at any rate, but, and I, and I being Jewish felt a little uncomfortable about filming in their synagogue on, on the Shabbos, on the, on the Sabbath, but because it doesn't say anything about electricity in the Torah, they drove their cars. They had no trouble with me. It was silly. <laughs> anyway, that was the beginning of my, um, my, my, my making films. Um, but I did continue. I mean, when I, interestingly enough, I'll just say this, I then did my, I hate, I mean, it was so misogynist. My professor who Marty Scorsese For sure. dedicated Raging Bull to told me, mm -hmm. don't, I, I might as well quit because there's no place for women in the film business. And the highest grade I could get was a C. And so, oh, good God. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, there've been documentaries, so many recent actually programs that have been, you know, about this very subject. And it astounds me actually that you have such a bountiful collection of work and your body of work is immense. It's, it's, it's fantastic. You know, I, I salute you. Like how, I mean, how did you do it? Well, I, you know, I, I just chose to dive into things that I didn't understand, but deeply interested me. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and when I graduated, I, um, because the school was so misogynist, I mean, I actually left my junior year and, and went and did a year in Israel. And then I came back and went to LA. I went to Hebrew University and then I went to Immaculate Heart College but the nuns were about to get excommunicated. So I figured I better, <laughs> I better graduate <laughs> from school. So I came back to NYU and I, I discovered at the very end, the Porta Pack, which was this, you know, the beginning of video and there was no hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So there was no tradition. So it was extremely liberating. And um, I worked, and my first first thing I did is I worked with the Alternate Media Center, which was started by this guy, George Stoney and, and Red Burns, who was really influenced by the idea of television for social change. And so this is before mm. the internet. And so that's what I did. The first thing I did is mm -hmm. I, I did a project in a small town and I taught people in town how to make their own television. And I went live once a week. And as a result, the first you know, the city fathers were knocking down this gorgeous Victoriana. It was Cape May, New Jersey. And it was the first time black people didn't sell their votes at the bar. And the first time that a democratic mayor got elected in a hundred years. And now that town, which was, I think the most depressed in the state of New Jersey is one of four landmark towns in the country. It's gorgeous. Changed the culture, politics, wow. economics of that town forever. Anyway, to answer your question, I just, chose things that I wanted to deeply understand. And then, mm -hmm. and I also was very interested in pushing the form of the medium. Like mm -hmm. I think, you know, the medium is the message. So if I was gonna make something, I had to think about how, how was I making it that would communicate what was important. That mm -hmm. was like how, how, do you, how do you communicate? I love how boundary breaking you were from the start. And just even from the contrasting of what your mom said and, and what you just said now, it's so, so that you are, you're drawn to obviously subject matter that, that you, know, you are super interested in, but also the idea of making the unseen seen and breaking those boundaries. It's, it's so inherent to, to you and to your work. And um, so I would love to ask you about two of the many groundbreaking films that you did, um, especially one is Joe and Maxie, 
which is about your father and your relationship with your father after your mother passed away from cancer. And also uh, South Central Los Angeles, which is about the 1992 LA riots. Um, because you are able to tell such raw personal stories and in this very unvarnished way, which at the time was just like, you just, you just didn't see that. Um, and that it offers, these films also offer perspectives that you don't normally see. Can you tell me about these two films? Well, because I was in film school, I thought I'd better make a film because I just mm -hmm. really wanted to be a painter but since I was there. And my father, um, as, as straight as my mother was, my father was a kind of bigger than life character and did whatever he wanted, despite my mother, whatever. He just did whatever he wanted. And he, to me, I wanted to be that. I wanted to be creative like that. I mean, he, he wasn't creative in the way that we think of creative. I mean, I grew up, he was in the trucking business and, and uh, I lived, grew up on a junk farm really in, 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 a, in a junkyard. And, um, but my father just, I think in his yearbook it said he wanted to create the electric car. I mean, you can imagine how many decades ago that was. So wow. it was very inventive. And when my mother died, I was 23 and I realized that she was a buffer between me and my father. And that for the first time in my life, I was alone with him. Like I was in a car, I thought, I can't believe I'm in the car with my father. Like that was like such a huge big deal. And my father, I mean, they were young, but, you know, they got married, I think, you know, my mother was 20. So, and they, they my father had a, grew up in a, horrible circumstance, I'm sure. And so, you know, he had so much love for my mother and then I show up like right away within a year. And, you know, I think it probably made him quite jealous, which I understood, you know, I didn't understand it then, you know, it takes years of work to, to have compassion for your parents when you think they hate you. Um, and so I was, I mean, my father did not know how to be a father. Once he said to me, I said, dad, let's go out to dinner. And he said, I can't go out to dinner with you. You're my daughter. So you can see mm. how confusing. Mm. So I, but he, mm. I wanted to understand what made him tick. And so what I did is I did this film, which at the time was groundbreaking because people were only making documentaries that were objective narr narratives with narrators. And I had just gone from making a, uh, an animation in college that took me three months to make three minutes to making video where I could make a half an hour and a half an hour. And the idea of being able to just be with someone like a fly on the wall was what prompted me to make that film. And people were not doing that in film. So it was really the influence of my doing video. Video wasn't good enough to use at the time. So I actually mm -hmm. made film, yeah. film, 16 mm -hmm. million film. And then I realized in the first shoot that it wasn't about my father, like I was in it. And, and so it was a very intimate, intimate deep dive. And at the time, a lot of people couldn't see it. I remember there was a huge fight at the, at a public television, they brought like independent filmmakers together with all the station managers and some of the manner, somebody, somebody wanted public television to put it on and somebody did, they had huge fights about it. People said, nobody can watch this, you know. I remember the William Allison White Institute said, oh, this is not for lay people the same day the Museum of Modern Art said we would like to show it, you know, it was, mm. Wow. Hugely confronting. And what I loved about it, I, I thought when I grow up, I'm going to make a film that's catalytic to people's emotions. And what happened was this, this was like that for people. This really mm -hmm. was like that. Mm -hmm. I remember a man saying to me after a film festival in, a, in LA, who played your father? So it was so real that he thought wow. of fiction. Mm-hmm. 
So it was a very intimate film about a daughter-father relationship, which at the time, and also, I mean, it's about love, even though right. after my exactly. mother died, my father got cancer. It was really about love and expressing love or the inability to express love or, or and people, it was so raw that people would ask, you know, I'd go to a film festival and people would ask things like, did you fuck your father? Or did your father fuck you or whatever? And I was so shocked. Wow. I felt because I had made such a vulnerable film, you know, such a mm -hmm. film that I owed it to people to be in those conversations. So it was, and people thought I was crazy to make the film. And it was, I have to tell you, I knew I had to make it. It was just an act of beautiful. Act. So what, what I, you know, in retrospect, you know, that, that, that's the best thing to be fearless and passionate and have blinders on and just have that leap of faith, which I did, but, and, and it was not easy to show. I mean, I had to say, I, I, it was like, not an, it was an, I remember one one a reviewer thought it was like an ego thing that I showed this one. And it was exactly the opposite. It took I had to be egoless. I had to say I know this film is is can be valuable, and so mm -hmm. I have to put myself aside. I remember they showed it at the Ford Foundation to a bunch of women, and I was so terrified that this is like the height of the feminist movement that they would tell me that it's such an anti-feminist film. I was so terrified that I didn't make it <laughs> written. And so when they said, oh my God, it's like a feminist film, I thought, okay, I, uh, but I had no clue. I really had mm -hmm. no clue. But that's extraordinary. I mean, that took a lot of courage for you to make. I mean, it's just incredible, just laying yourself open that way on so many levels, on a personal level, on sort of a, cultural zeitgeist level <laughs> and just in the industry at the time I mean this is that was amazing yeah and in some places it was highly high you know it was called oh the best film of the film festival and then some places it was like oh my god you can't show this mm. no, this film it's too 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 much and it still gets shown it's interesting it holds up which you know as I said it was a total act of passion and leap of faith like I had kind of almost no clue it was like you know made with instinct in a way right 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 and it's now actually in the permanent archives of MoMA right at the museum of yes actually they just yes. uh, are finishing making a 4k restoration copy you know they're oh, you know it's so amazing they, congratulations yeah yeah, yeah. 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 um you get to see it you know it, and this is the th this is the, the, the you know you see the intimacy woven through all of your subject matter I mean, in so many of your films and that's what I love about your filmmaking um, and your art. Taking that and then adding the social issue storytelling piece, which then brings us to South Central Los Angeles, which is another like another you know groundbreaking film because that's never happened before having. A story not told from and up by outsiders kind of observing but rather from the people living the experience and yeah i mean tell tell, tell us about about that well, when i um when i when i, I in the, in the 90s i moved to la and uh and i had all these projects feature film projects and, you know, it's it's interesting. I just have to say this: as an independent filmmaker, dealing with the Hollywood studios, you think, oh, I, you know, you don't know anything; they know everything. I was so shocked. Uh, I was really just shocked because uh, I I had a project, Rob, Robert De Niro, blah blah blah. You know, I had these projects, and I would watch them do the stupidest things. Uh, it was shocking. Anyway, and then. <laughs> <laughs> and, then the, and then the LA riots happened and I had no understanding, you know, I was kind of new to LA. I didn't really understand why it happened. You know, in LA, you get in your car, you never, you can manage not to even, you know, see 
section, you know, all the Koreans live in one area and the Latinos yeah. in another area and the gangs are, it was in the middle of gang wars and, and I didn't understand it. And I thought, you know, we have to understand what's going on here. And so I thought, what if we give cameras to people who live in the areas of the riots and create mentorships with filmmakers of the same communities to make a film from the inside out. It's funny, I couldn't raise any money in Hollywood for this. I raised most of the money from- Oh, I'm not surprised. Yeah, German television, German and yeah. French television put up the money. And the other irony was that um, even though I found a Korean filmmaker and a Latino filmmaker to work within those their own community, I couldn't find a black person that was a filmmaker who would go to South Central. I remember calling Warrington Hudlin, um, who's a, 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 a very good black film director. I think he started the Black Film Festival or something. I mean, he's like, a, he's, he's, he's a great guy. And he, he wouldn't go there. I mean, I call, you know, I tried to find somebody. So I ended up, uh -huh. I mean, I found somebody who was, anyway, there were, there were times that I was in South Central at three o'clock in the morning with self-professed murderers, robbers, and kidnappers. And um, actually I was more afraid of the smog. <laughs> the, <laughs> I, I really learned that it's really true that, that these industrial areas that create smog are really in mm -hmm. city areas where, where um, people really are suffering from all kinds of problems because of you know, the smog there was, was really yeah. awful. Pollution. So, but it was the first, so we did this film and it was such a deep dive for me into issues of race because I did it to try to understand race and intolerance. You know, I did that film about my mm -hmm. father to understand my father. I'd made this film to understand race and intolerance in this country and what to do about it. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, oh, you know, maybe we need this kind of national uh uh group therapy or something and i and i found that the issues of race were so deep all over the place i mean uh, 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 um one of the black filmmakers that i finally found mm -hmm. was upset with me because why were we telling a gang story and i said well i the filmmakers could choose whatever they wanted. The mentors could choose whatever mm -hmm. stories they wanted. I said, your father is a bank, for, you know, it works in a bank. I don't know if he was a president, whatever. I said, you know, you could focus on your father. It, it's up to you. And the more that she realized that she had power, the less, the less that she could hold, do it. It became mm -hmm. analytic. And it was like trying to understand oh, interesting. generations. And then she said to me one day, I was better than my co-producer because I was Jewish and she was white. And the truth was that she was Jewish. She just probably didn't look as Jewish as I did. And so the mm. issues were so, wow. so, 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 so deep. And but it was the first film that played on Showtime that was made by real people on television, you know, that was told from the inside out. And, you know, when the George Floyd story happened, mm -hmm. thought, oh my God, we haven't really moved at all. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I found myself doing this project in Soho when Soho got looted after during the George Floyd protests. You know when when Soho got boarded <clears throat> got boarded up and and I and I thought oh my this is God. art to heart right yeah so I I you know mm -hmm. I thought all of Soho was boarded this is a, a, during the George Floyd protests mm -hmm. like in twenty eight years later all of right Soho got looted and. Um, they boarded it all up. And I thought if there ever was a time for artists to express themselves, it's now. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, that's another story, but it is sort of amazing that, that, that um, you know, we started me and a, a 
a small group of friends actually said, okay, let's do it. And um, that's incredibly powerful. I mean, this, this is, I think, I think you, I think you should absolutely share this with us because it takes the, you know, um, South Central Los Angeles film from 1992 all the way to today. It's like 28 years later and the issues are still there. And, you know, and yet, and at the same time, it brings up these, these just moments where art can really heal. And, you know, can you share some of those stories? Because it, it's, you know, it's amazing what you did with Art to Heart in Soho. Well, the, the, uh, well, and what's interesting is the, the, also the film back then, you know, one, mm -hmm. of the, one of the videographers that we gave a camera to was a high school student whose mother was a crack addict, whose brother was in jail and kept using his name, you know, so he had kept having trouble and he's taking care of his 10 year old brother. And this kid, because of what he did with us, ended up getting a job in the mail room at, 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 at uh, I think it was at ICM or something. So it was mm -hmm. great. Um, yeah. yeah, so when, when when Soho was looted, and I mean looted, everything, you know. Yes, you, I remember, I remember. You look, at, you look in the window last year. Mm -hmm. at, at Gucci's the next morning, and there's like nothing but hangers on the floor. Mm -hmm. And um, so they boarded up the entire community. And this is really the birthplace of American art. So it's where in the 60s and the 70s, it's where performance art started and conceptual art and everything, music, Steve, Steve Reich, Philip Glass, uh, dance, yeah. theater, the Worcester group. I mean, every act, the beginning of independent filmmaking, the beginning of the video, of, of you know, of really the video movement, uh, video art, guerrilla television, everything's really kind of started in this neighborhood, Donald Judd. And um, so the whole, all of Soho was boarded up, which had now become the height of retail. You know, I, I never realized uh -huh. that I lived on a, on a street that what had Dior and Saint Laurent and Louis Vuitton and Tiffany mm -hmm. and Fendi and, you know, just went on and on. And um, so, I, yeah, so I had this thought, of course, well, it's like a huge canvas. And I mentioned it to a couple friends that Bobby Van had this idea, Miriam Noval. Anyway, we invited a couple friends. We said, okay, let's do it. And somebody, you know, got Misha Hyman to make lunch and Blick to give us paint. It started with a hundred people, you know, just word of mouth, a hundred people. And we had, we had really encouraged people to paint optimism and unity and kind of think about the positivism that social change could create. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started, but very quickly it created a context and for what ended up being over seven, 800 paintings made by over 300 artists of protests and prayers about everything, you know, Trump, voting, trans, mm -hmm. it, 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 of course, a lot of, about racism and, um, and so what was really, a couple of things were really amazing because the first few weeks and nobody touched the art, like nobody graffitied on the art. And for a couple of weeks, you could walk through, it was like an open air museum because we're still, we're under COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I met a guy on the street who was taking people's names from their artwork and purchasing art from artists who had never sold before, which was amazing. And there was, wow. there was another artist on the street who was painting that I discovered he had a little suitcase near him with all love decals on it. He had lived in Soho 19 years earlier, had come back from Europe and he'd been living in a homeless shelter for months. He couldn't get back on his feet and he came out and he painted. And there was another guy who got evicted for, there were a couple people got evicted from their apartments because they couldn't pay their rent. Mm -hmm. And then the, the Nomo Hotel, which is this very fancy hotel at Crosby and Howard invited five of the artists who banded together to, to move in. And they, uh, they're just moving out now again, but they've been, they have been- Is it the Nomad? The Nomad Hotel? No, it's called, it's called 
no mo. It used to be the oh. Mondrian. It, 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 yes, it, yes. At the end of Cosby and Howard. Yes. And right. um, and so they they gave them their nightclub because it still was COVID lockdown. They gave them their nightclub to paint in as a studio. They wow. They rethinked <laughs> the hotel, which was so cool because I thought, oh, yeah, street art of five very diverse, different artists. Yes going to work together to re-signature the hotel which they did and mm -hmm. they painted their rooms and and I think you know it really helped I mean I think that the rest of the it makes it super super cool and um so uh and so it housed these artists who a couple artists who were were just homeless and and actually now they have the attention of Sotheby's so now that the new manager in the hotel has said oh well they have to leave the hotel one of them is uh -huh. a mansion on on Gramercy Park of one of the I guess somebody from Sotheby's so the story continues to go on we have been filming it since the summer because and and this was the lesson for me this really was it was an amazing lesson which was things happened so quickly and we responded so quickly that it mm -hmm. was such flow that there was no time to really think. And that out of this, people came down from their lofts, some people in tears, so grateful that there was some soul of art back in the neighborhood or that the mm -hmm. neighborhood was being revitalized. And what was amazing is the changes that happened and what grew organically out of people just expressing, again, the passion of their hearts without any thought of consideration or remuneration mm -hmm. or anything. And a lot of people, and it was amazing because there were people, there people were famous, you know, famous painters, famous artists, People painted for the first time, 60 year olds, 70, 60 year olds, and people came from other boroughs because it was oh. Soho. So for me, who's lived here for decades, it was so moving. And I think so, so true. I mean, I, there are a lot of famous artists who still live in Soho that I didn't even know lived here. So it was <laughs> pretty amazing. And I think for the first time ever, which is the biggest difference is that the businesses have shifted the way they thought about the arts and their respect for the arts and to see that art really vitalized mm. that that here is a big difference that is extraordinary that is a big difference so yeah it's consciousness and and really change people's lives and, and you know um yeah it reminded me of one of my favorite paintings this guy made a painting that said George Floyd is not a martyr he's a catalyst mm. and I thought that was really and, and pause yeah and Mona mm -hmm. Contemporary which has a hundred thousand square feet in Jersey City and Miami and Greenwood and in Chicago are, is going to do a show of um, the best of the art from all over the country that's been painted during that time very cool very cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it all, I mean, you were talking about that element of surprise, right? Where what can emerge from a moment of loss or from a moment of sort of devastation and, you know, it, and it's, it's, it's extraordinary how you cannot predict, but then when you, when we surrender to that flow and surrender to that moment and just kind of let it happen without having put too, too much, you know, without putting too much thought into it, just amazing things can happen. Um, and that brings me actually to Design Science Studio um, and your work, speaking of emergence and regeneration and your work in Europe's a movement in water. And just to let everyone know what Design Science Studio is, it's a part of Buckminster Fuller Institute that is a developmental incubator for art that inspires a regenerative future that works for 100% of life. So again, you know, I love having you on the show because what you are all about is connecting those dots, is moving forward, pushing through, breaking boundaries and kind of 
shining a light and also just opening a path for what is possible, right? Through art and expression and creativity. So tell us about a movement in water because I, I mean, I love all of your projects. But this one is amazing. Well, when, when I lived in LA, I would spend mm -hmm. a lot of time in the desert, in desert hot springs, mm -hmm. and where, which I found to be so regenerative, so restorative. And I've always loved being in water, whether, it, mm -hmm. it's funny, I look back, the very first thing I ever did out of college, actually first, was to do a film on stop ocean dumping. So, uh, so okay, full I, circle. I, I've always loved being in water. It's the best place mm -hmm. to be. It's the most creative, restorative, my place where thoughts emerge. You know, it, it's just mm -hmm. a very creative space. And I started filming water then, and um, these gorgeous abstractions of water, and started filming water all over the world, wherever I went, and the more that I really thought about water, you know, what was, so this was again, my inquiry. I wanted to understand water, but not, mm -hmm. you know, enough attention is being paid or well, maybe not enough attention is being paid, but I felt like it wasn't my job to take on sanitation issues or how to save our oceans mm -hmm. oh, these mm -hmm. are extremely important but what what seemed to really again it goes back to intimacy that was most important to me was water like uh, i drink a lot of water like what is the water i'm putting in my body my body all our bodies are mostly made of water our molecules are 99 percent water i love being in water what is water and what does it mean for us? And so I early on had this idea of creating this environment in which people could just chill. It would shift their, to be in water changes your physiology. And I mean, some of the early installation work I did, people would come in after work, totally fried and, and anxious and they would sit down and, and they said in five minutes they were totally chilled just by being immersed in video and of water and and sound nat natural sound composed sound um uh, live sound indigenous mm -hmm. songs calling in spirits of the water and um i in my research about water i was very lucky to meet gina bria who is the founder of the hydration foundation which is dedicated to understanding this new science of water, which very much looks at what is the water in you really doing? Understanding that water holds memory and consciousness and connectivity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. information. And right now the water in me is resonating with the water in you. And this is the kind of mm -hmm. feel, you know, this is the field, this is what, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, we, we have partnered because the science, even though this experience of a movement in water, which let me just tell you what it is, a movement in water is this kind of multimedia, interactive traveling public art installation. It's like a museum of water that mm -hmm. has eight very, very different experiences in which your body is kind of the proof of evidence, but they're deep experiences through art, through this art, 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 different, everything is different. And um, most of it is a breakthrough in technology of, of design and art and, and mm -hmm. uh, architecture. And it's a wow, it, it, a wow experience just as it is, but it's deeply rooted in, in the science, this new, the science of what we understand about water. So that you even get to sing into a pool in which what you're seeing are, is what your cells look like, not modified through a synthesizer or a chip, mm -hmm. but actually what, what our cells look like. 
And um, so one of the things that I find to be really true is that uh, a lot of documentaries, like I know there was a great, uh, there have been a couple of amazing documentaries about water, but they're lucky if they're in a theater for a week. We learn mm -hmm. by experiencing. And most of these experiences, um, I don't know if you were in New York for Ashes and Snow or the Rain Room or, you know, people stand in line four or five hours to see these things. Even the Museum of Feelings, which was basically a Glade commercial, they, they were pumping scents through these rooms that were playful that I got a migraine from. But, you know, people love to have these sensory kind of experiences. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what this is. This is an opportunity to really understand water in you, which and uh, which also increases your reverence for water. And and there there is one of the experiences where you sit in this kind of inner sanctum, and you can lay down or whatever. And it starts by the calling in of the spirits by indigenous people all over the world mm -hmm. the waters and it will shift your physiology and increase your reverence for for water and for nature and i think that this has an opportunity to inspire somebody to be a scientist or a conservationist or a philanthropist or a biologist or an artist mm -hmm. or whatever it, it is a kind of interactive inspiring um experience so i'm excited about it I think. so exciting yeah. i'm excited about it oh my goodness i cannot wait um you know it, it also would inspire i'd imagine just the greater awareness of the connection between nature science technology um and our world and and how important it is you know through these experiential experiences <laughs> that you know we can we can have an interaction with it that just you know that reignites our knowing which is there it's just that we get caught up in the day-to-day -day whatever modern life you know and stress that everybody has to deal with one of the things that was really interesting um uh especially with regard to health is that one of the i know one of the pieces in in that um installation exhibit is that well desert people hydrate better with less water because of the water gel plants that they consume like aloe cactus tubers and water in this form is uh called structured water or crystalline water and conducts electronic signaling much better in our bodies so hydration at a deep level like you just said literally alters not only our health but our perception as well because of the signaling that goes on in our board in our bodies unfortunately we are all perpetually dehydrated and that's another thing because we don't you know we think drinking the eight glasses eight you know 16 ounce glasses of water a day is enough but then the water you usually drink has it's, it's kind of dead it's not alive the way that this structured water is in plants and fruits even right and um Dr. Jared Pollock from the University of Washington has done a lot of research on this. So that's also incorporated as well. What really struck me, because um, I've heard you heard your conversation, uh, conversations um, about this project with others and is how, you know, continually pushing form to commute, how you are continually pushing form to communicate because your work and what you are trying to express really is, doesn't fit neatly into one pigeonhole. It's very much spans and connects all these different knowledge silos, which quite honestly, in my opinion, it's it's so healthy for us to really start connecting. If we're not doing that now, we're just doing something wrong. I feel that that is the natural way we exist. It's in, it's in systems thinking, it's in systems design. And so for example, a movement in water really connects science, art, technology, spirituality, um, education and civics, and it's, you know, that's pretty extraordinary. Yes, it does. And it, so it has the opportunity on the one hand to um, 
let people know that, uh, oh, actually, Gina always says to me, optimal hydration is an altered state. So that's sort of really- Yes. Comprehensive, right? <laughs> and, and that- It's our, true. It's yeah, true. And that, yeah. that our food can be cucumbers, whatever. Our uh, apples can be more hydrated mm -hmm. than a glass of water. So absolutely, really differently about our about our about hydrating ourselves, and ultimately, um, it's it's the big mission of um, the Hydration Foundation and something that we support um, mm -hmm. is that if we can regenerate our soil, then the nutrients in the in the crops are better. The yield is better in one growing season, and it sequesters more carbon. So. We're really thinking about water as the solution, not water as the problem. And mm. is, you know, um, I I have tackled a lot of dark subject matter, right, in my mm -hmm. life, and I'm really thinking now: how do we create change through celebration? Mm. How do we? How do we? Well, this brings me to the next, <laughs> to another another subject you might not want to explore, but I, I was going to say, you know, it's interesting with uh, ayahuasca, which is a plant medicine. Well, that, that was, speaking of altered states and nature and how that comes together, that's exactly what I was going to ask you next. So please go ahead. Well, I was just going to say with ayahuasca, which I will explain in two seconds, what you, what you learn is that the lessons often really come in the light you know they don't come from mm -hmm. this kind of inquiry where you put yourself into a mental maze trying to figure something out or you get stuck they come like at the least expected moments in the light so you know how we change how to create personal and social change has always been a big question for me you know big mm -hmm. aspiration you know i i i feel very privileged to do this work I, I feel privileged to do whatever I'm doing. I, I used to feel very guilty about it because my mother really wanted me to be a secretary or a teacher. And so I felt really, I felt- We're so really thankful good. that you are who you are and not a secretary. <laughs> so, so and I you felt, are a teacher actually. So I felt really guilty about doing whatever I was doing, but I at least always felt if, I, if I'm the every person that can do the exploration that come back from the journey with some jewels for other people, then I've done the right thing. I remember in Cape May when I was making this television for social change, my mother was still alive and she said, Maxie, what are you wasting your time making television? Give people jobs. And so I, so I like to also always think about giving people jobs, but I do know that um, the, it, how we change and how we create social change is extremely, is, is, is I guess the kind of activism that is um, kind of hand in hand. It isn't the, it, it's the, it's the, in a way it's kind of my moral or my obligation, but it's not like obligatory in a sense that it's a burden. It's just that uh, if I'm gonna do something, I want it to be of value to somebody beyond myself. It's a lot of work to do just for yourself. So I- That's uh, a great way to frame it. Mm -hmm. So if, if you want me to talk about ayahuasca for a second. <laughs> Yes, because, you know, you executive produced the film From Shock to Awe, which is about two uh, combat veterans who suffered from severe PTSD and how revolutionary um, treatments like ayahuasca and ceremonies like that, and, and also with psilocybin, it, you know, is, is, is incredibly helpful for, you know, a lot of these veterans who are already, you know, unfortunately have been addicted to prescription or other drugs and, or it's just not working and they're just, you know, spiraling down. Uh, please, please share those stories with us. Well, I, the, I, I may, yes, I may. So, um, I, so first let me explain to people who don't maybe know. Ayahuasca mm -hmm. is a, a, 
a brew made in the Amazon rainforest, originally by tribes who discovered that taking out of tens of thousands of species of plants, that taking the vine of one plant and a leaf of a totally different fruit plant only when brewed together became psychoactive. And usually the shaman in the tribe would drink this psychoactive plant and travel in the astral if the tribe was hungry to see where maybe there were animals that could be captured for to feed the tribe or if somebody was sick to be able to really look kind of with x-ray eyes what was it that was going on and what did they need to heal and um he was the medicine man of the tribe and in the last 20 30 years particularly the last 20 years this kind of extraordinary elixir, this sacrament, um, has, has found its way from the rainforests of South America. It's, it's, it's used in all the countries of the Amazon, mm -hmm. Colombia and Ecuador and Peru and Brazil. Uh, Brazil mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. so it's found its way to us, to the modern world. And uh, it's truly um, in so many ways, still a mystery. It's just really being mm -hmm. started to be studied by, by, by science. And um, in the 90s, 98, 99, there were arrests in Europe and in the United States for people who were conducting ceremonies in the same way the ceremonies were being connect, conducted in Brazil. And I felt then, I, I, for the first time, I had an experience in 1989. And I felt this, the, it's, in, it's in the same category as heroin and, and cocaine and things that are, are Ill, illegal, drugs that are illegal. Right. And yet this has healed people of heroin addiction and cocaine addiction and, and is not addictive. So I thought, well, um, it really deserves to be understood. And while I felt mm -hmm. science was the best protection, on the other hand, I felt, well, you know, it's important to make a film. So if, if it, if sort of the shit hits the fan, you know, there's <laughs> something, there's something to be shown that may, that allows people to understand. So when I saw From Shock to Awe being made, which really these veterans have, have, tried suicide a number of times. And actually one mm -hmm. of the combat officer, one of the cop officers, his wife is a, what left her four-year-old child to go into combat. So, and, and you see in this film, by the way, you see how screwed up that, you, you know, these kids are gonna grow because you see how numb their parents are and how distracted, mm -hmm. and how, how, you know, and angry and anxious. Mm -hmm. It's what kind of generation are we going to grow, right? And so when these veterans did everything the VA had to offer, and you finally see them go through ayahuasca, and you see what happens to them a year and a half later, a year and a quarter later, it's an extraordinary transformation. And you realize, so I felt this was a patriotic film. Mm -hmm. What's more patriotic than healing our veterans? Mm -hmm. um, don't need them storming the Capitol again, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so this was a way to really better understand ayahuasca, which in this time where there is so much trauma and where psychotherapy can take so long and psychoanalysis, and some of the, you know, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work, takes a long time. What What is really extraordinary about this Brew is that it has the power to heal. As many people have said, one ceremony is worth two years of psychotherapy. And I think more than that. Yeah, more. I than think more than two years. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say ten years. <laughs> so, so I think, and so now I'm making another film. I'm making mm -hmm. a film, ayahuasca diaries that is intended for people who are both curious, and for people who are. Um, deeply experienced to understand, on the one hand, more deeply where it comes from, 
and mm -hmm. what does it mean and what is our sacred reciprocity to these tribes that have given this to us mm -hmm. and also to better understand how to integrate because these a, a lot of this can be it's not for everyone it's not mm -hmm. just for the curious it's you know you kind of feel if you if you decide to do this it's something usually you're called to do for mm -hmm. good reason and um so the film which also includes an amazing amazing um piece that i did with a a, a psychiatrist a, a number of psychiatrists i've talked to have said that, that this is beyond anything that we have in our arsenal because this only can do good and does it so quickly mm -hmm. um so for this much deeper understanding of ayahuasca is why i'm making this film and to also show how it can change world culture mm -hmm. so i think absolutely I'm, yeah, so I, it, I'm trying to find a, a study at the moment of where it was done in Sao Paulo in a favela and Brazil in a prison. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been talking to Palestinians, Israelis, so. Um, who... Which is extraordinary when you told me that, that there are Israelis and Palestinians coming together after millennia of conflict to be able to sit at a table and do ceremony together. And what I'm, I'm so just eager to find out what happens in that process. So um, I'm dying to see your film. <laughs> it's done. I don't know, can you share a little well, tidbit? <laughs> well, I Sorry, say that again? Say we're still, I just have to say, we're still making yes. it and still fundraising mm -hmm. for it. You know, it's one of the plights of being an independent filmmaker in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, well, it, it's interesting because I have been talking to people who were, you know, Palestinians who were in jail, who mm -hmm. were killers and fighters and haters and the mm -hmm. same thing with Israelis who were in the army and who through this experience have been able to see so much about themselves and understand unity you know the very it's interesting the very first time i i drank ayahuasca i had this sense because i did it within the context of the santo daime which is um mm -hmm. the syncretic church from brazil where it's legal in brazil i mean there are hundreds of people in a church who are partaking yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a traditional idea of a church but at any rate and i thought wow you know maybe this could this could this could heal 2000 years of anti-semitism and and, mm -hmm. and and i had this idea of doing this film and i thought oh i want to end this film doing a ceremony on the river jordan you know there in the jordan river it, you know with muslims and christians and jews um jews, yeah exactly because you really see beyond what we can touch and you really have a palpable visceral experience of divinity of the divine and you really have um an experience of yourself you see yourself in a in a way that burns off neuroses and that allows you to make the corrections you need in your life. And actually often you don't have to make those corrections. Those corrections are being made, uh, whether it's on a physical level, um, a psychological level, you know, mentally or spiritually. So it's the mm -hmm. kind of transformation that I know growing up was unthinkable. I mean, I used to, as a kid, I, I used to love to watch um, uh, TV evangelists, because I couldn't understand how people could have so much faith they could get up from a wheelchair. I like it was like so beyond anything I understood. It was just like, wow, there are people who have a sense that something outside of themselves can make a difference, you know. So 
whether it's outside or inside, it is so deeply profound what you get to experience. And so, and, and yet I just want to say one thing, because in, in case mm-hmm. people, you know, listen and they think it's a panacea and they get all excited. I, there was a guy I know who told me the story that he did, he drank ayahuasca once and he had this fabulous celestial experience. And then a voice came to him and said, now you've seen everything that you need to see. You never have to drink again. So many years later, he was helping somebody who was facilitating a group and he saw how much change people went through. He saw how incredible it was for them. So the next time he decided he was gonna drink again. And as soon as he drank, he heard the same voice said, what are you doing here? Didn't we tell you not to drink again? That you didn't not to do this again? Like how to understand that level of mystery or consciousness or knowingness or whatever it is 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 really beyond the beyond to me. So it that's why these things are called mystery schools. Absolutely, and and yet, you know, you all we all call to it, and this is a whole topic for a whole other <laughs> podcast episode and many podcast episodes. Um, but I'm totally with you on this because we have so many amazing natural resources and plants are so much our allies and there are some you know teach master teacher plants which ayahuasca is one and there are others as well and um i think we as humans have just been we cut ourselves off just because of the way that we've you know evolved and and living and we are now kind of coming full circle back to connecting to so many of these ancient wisdom healing traditions and also respecting and also protecting the indigenous peoples who steward this wisdom for all of us and who of course have been abused, persecuted, you know, and um, still are. just, and still yes, and still are. No, exactly, exactly, um, which is my point. And so it's actually very important at this juncture to recognize the, the wisdom keepers and beyond just these kinds of healing medicines. There's so much other wisdom, for example, in terms of soil regeneration, permaculture, like all of that. I mean, everything that we need at this moment of existential crisis for humanity, they have so many answers that if we just listened and respected, we could be in a very different place. So on that note, Maxi, thank you so very much. I'm so, so happy that you could come on the show today well this was so delightful this was great talking to you so fun yeah and how can we find you support you uh is the best way to go to your website maxicoenstudio.com or is are there other ways there's maxicoenstudio.com and there's also a movementandwater.com okay and are you on instagram as well uh, yeah, I'm on Maxi Cohen Studio and A period, movement period, in period, water. Uh, okay. Again for that. And uh, yeah, and I'm Maxi at Maxi Cohen Studio.com. Maxi Co- yeah, Maxi at Maxi Cohen Studio.com. So, also, anybody who um, wants to support the films that you're making, wants to get involved somehow, that's the best way to find you. And I will put all of that in the show notes as well. Thank you. This was such a pleasure. I love talking to you. Oh, me too. (laughs) So fun. Thank you again, Maxie.